Good morning, church. I'm happy and excited to be here with you. I wore my good black t-shirt, as you can tell. I'd like to say hello to all the families worshiping from home today, including my own, Connor and Killian. Be good, boys, uh, for your mom this morning. Um, we have been doing a sermon series all summer on prayer. We've been, we've been looking at what the Bible says about prayer, and we're going to continue that today. Before we do that, let us pray right now. Father God, thank you for these people. Thank you for uh, this church that is home to all of us. Lord, I ask that your word would be proclaimed in this place today. Lord, I ask that you would be glorified today by uh, the words that come out of my mouth. And Lord, I ask that you would not let me say anything false or misleading or untrue. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would bless and protect uh, the ears of those who hear today. Uh, and we are so grateful for your son Jesus and for the Bible. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we talked about uh, Psalms early on in the summer, talking about how Psalms, a lot of which uh, were written as prayers, are a great place to start. If you uh, don't know what to pray or how to pray, open a Psalm and pray through it. That can be a real uh, blessing to somebody who's just not feeling motivated, but they know that they need to go before the Father. They know that they uh, lack communion with the Father and they, they want to go be with Him but you don't have the words. Open a psalm. We've heard sermon series about, or sermons about um, what to pray and when we should be praying and how to pray. Uh, today, we're going to take it in a little bit of a different direction, but still very much involved in the theme of prayer. We're going to look uh, in the book of Colossians. And if you have a Bible, please open to the book of Colossians chapter one. We're going to take a look at uh, an example of Paul praying for the early church and asking God that this church think in a certain way, behave in a certain way, and pursue certain kingdom truths and certain um, elements of God's will. And I want us to look at that through the lens of our church and us as believers and consider that these are the types of things that we should be praying for our church and for us as individuals, for our families, for the church at large. We're going to be, again, in Colossians chapter 1, and I'll give you a little background. We're going to start in verse 9, but it helps to know, I think, what the first eight verses say here. So Colossians is a letter written by Paul to this early church in Colossae, and this early church was started by a guy named Epaphras or Epaphras. I went to college on the internet. I don't know how to say most of the names in the Bible, but we're going to get through it. I do know how to proclaim the name of Jesus, though, and that's the most important one. So, so this guy, Epaphras, had started this church because he had heard the word of God. The gospel had taken root in his soul. He uh, proclaimed the name of Jesus, and he said, I have to go back to my hometown and plant a church. I need, I need the name of Jesus to be proclaimed. And so Paul had gotten word that his buddy had started this church and that things were going well, that, that the spirit work had been happening there, that the gospel seeds had been planted, and that they'd been bearing fruit. And so Paul writes this letter and he starts the first eight verses and he says, I've heard about all this great work being done in your community and in your church. So read along with me now in Colossians chapter one, verse nine. I've heard about all this great stuff. And so from the day that we've heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Amen. This is the word of our Lord, and it is good, and it is true. We are grateful for it. My hope today is that we can look at Paul's words here in this prayer. You know, he's, he's appealing to the God of the universe on behalf of this, this church. And I think that these are really good examples of things that we should be praying for for our church. And my hope and intention here, I think, today is that we would step back and examine God's will. God's will for us, God's will 
for the body and how our worldview or our will aligns with that or does not align with that. Are we focusing on what God wants us as a church to be focusing on, as, as Christians and individuals and families to be focusing on? Are we treating people, are we talking about people and about things in a way that reflects God's will for us as, as believers and as Christians? It's, it's, it seems simple on the face, but I, wanna, I want you to consider this. So my sermon today is called Walk Worthy, Bear Fruit, Give Thanks. Walk Worthy, Bear Fruit, give thanks. In verse 9, Paul says, my prayer is that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, verse 10, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Think about that. What does that mean? To walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. What? The Lord? Who is God? God is a perfect, righteous, holy being, creator and sustainer of the universe. I'm sorry, Paul. Walk in a manner worthy of that God? That, that implies failure to me right out of the shot. Yeah, okay. So just be good enough. Walk in a way that reflects worth and value and, and acceptableness to this perfect and holy God. Well, Thank God, Paul says in three or four verses later here, he says, we're, we're giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you. Not the Father whom you qualified yourself to be in the presence of. No, no, no. The Father who, who qualifies you. Thank God. Because if we had only our own knowledge and understanding, not spiritual wisdom and understanding, but our own knowledge and understanding, we, we would never be able to, to walk in a manner worthy of that God but we are still called to do it. We are still called to walk worthy. How? Well, Paul says that he's praying that this church, that these, that these Christians, be filled with the knowledge of God's will. As a sinner and, and as a person who is way too concerned with the world, I'm really, really aware of my will. I know what I want. I know... Um, a lot of us probably always have sort of this next goal in mind. When I get a little more money, I'm going to buy this thing, or we're going to go move into that neighborhood. We really know what we think is best for our lives. My challenge today is let's put that against the lens and the scope of what God says is best for our lives. I want us to be praying that we would be intimately aware of God's will for our lives. Because so often they do not align. Right? What does the Bible say about our own knowledge and understanding? Lean not on your own wisdom. Right? We, we, we will deceive ourselves and take ourselves down all sorts of sinful paths that do not align with the will of the Father. It's who we are. We're sinners. Fortunately, there is a God who has qualified us to be more than that. So what does it look like to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. How do we do it? Paul goes on in this text that we just read here. He says, to walk in a manner fully pleasing of the Lord, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Increase in the knowledge of God. Well, there are a couple of ways to do that. We can be in prayer, which we've talked an awful lot about here this summer. And I think that that's a great place to start. We need to be praying like Paul to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Father God, I know that what my heart wants is almost always wrong. Let me have the desires of your will, right? That's something that we could and should all be praying for. So being in prayer will help us be filled with the knowledge of God. Being in God's word is critical. To seek to have the knowledge of God is to seek after the will of God. Because you, you get to know God's character in the word. You know who he is and what he likes and what he hates. What he's told us to do and not to do. How he feels about his people. All of that being filled with the knowledge of all of that helps us be filled with the knowledge of his will. We begin to know this, this God in a more intimate way. His desires and expectations for us as his people. 
Increasing in the knowledge of God happens here in corporate worship and singing his praises as a body. Which, by the way, Selah, great job this morning. You sound great. Being together in a life group, sharing and caring for each other, carrying the burdens of the body, that helps us grow in the knowledge of God, that helps us see God's will for God's people. We need to be pouring that in to our hearts and into our minds because we spend a whole lot of time pouring everything else into our hearts and our minds. The world is a tempting place, and our will and our desire is to charge after that stuff. Walk worthy. Seek to know the will of the Father and grow in the knowledge of God. Let's talk about bearing fruit for a minute. Verse 10, so, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work. Bearing fruit in every good work. I'm going to give you the disclaimer real quick. First of all, an appeal. If you chase me out of here with pitchforks today, please use the tip sparingly. Um, I know that I am a sinner, and I am not doing everything right. I know that I fall short, and I'm going to maybe touch on some things that are a little bit personal or challenging to hear about. And so I just want to start by saying I am chief hypocrite in the room today because they gave me the microphone. And I'm not getting all this stuff right. We're going to start there. So give me a little grace and hear my intention and maybe hear my intention more than you hear my words at points because I will get some of this wrong. Bearing fruit can be incredibly tricky. Particularly if we're seeking after the will of God because inside of us there is this battle raging on between our will and seeking after the will of God as sinners, as fallen and broken people. The Bible talks a lot about bearing fruit. Jesus talks about it in Matthew chapter 7. He says, we are like trees as believers. Like good trees produce good fruit. Dead trees produce bad fruit. Good trees don't produce bad fruit, and dead trees don't produce good fruit. Be good trees and produce good fruit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 talks about fruit of the Spirit. It says, the fruit of the Spirit, I'm going to say I'm real slow and I want you to think about this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I read that like a honey-do list, not a honey-done list. Like I, I've got a lot of work to do with fruit of the Spirit, with bearing fruit. I've really struggled the last few weeks in how to articulate this particular piece of this sermon as it relates to the world that we're living in right now. Um, this is a tough, tough year. And as I mentioned last week, all the commercials and all the, all the car commercials are reminding us constantly that these are unprecedented and challenging times. Indeed, right? Um... We started this year, it's an election year, those are always very contentious, right? Those drive a lot of division, a lot of tribalism, a lot of ideologies sort of rage on, my team, your team. Um, and then March happened, right? We get this, this just a small pandemic, global. Um, my hope for our country and for our church and for our families here is that it would sort of reflect like a 9-11 moment. If you guys remember September 11th, uh, everything changed overnight, and Chris Early worked at a place that sold flags, and on September 12th, I'm sure we sold more flags than any day in American history, right? I mean, all of a sudden, we were in this together. We were all more patriotic, caring for the burdens of others, rising up and arm in arm, we're going to get through this, and there was this sort of uh, unity of the spirit that came in the church, out of the church, everywhere. My hope in March, was that um, because this was a global pandemic and everybody had some sort of uncertainty or fear or suffering or struggle or knew somebody who was, that maybe that this would reflect that a bit, that we would come together. How long did that last? How long does it take to cook a Hot Pocket? About two minutes? 
I'd say about that long, right? We did the division just immediately came charging in on top of an election year and then great social uh, discourse and, and disagreement about serious social issues and social justice issues and things that, you know, there are, were hurt and broken people who were already hurt and broken. And then we put economic uncertainty on top of that in a political uh, environment that is so ugly and angry. It's been a very challenging year. And I've been, first of all, really encouraged by so much good fruit that's come out of this place and new people, love and light and sharing in the burdens of each other and building each other up and picking each other up. It's been awesome. But I've also been like kind of sad a little bit too. Um, to see the war of ideology come into the church has been heavy on my heart. And uh, I've heard people talk about the people on the other team, the other ideology, the other political party, whatever, the other opinion about ep epidemiology, because we're all scientists now and experts and everything, because we're freaked out and we're reading all the information we can read. We're all drawing different conclusions, and it's just putting this wedge and to hear the way that we as Christians talk about other people, Christians and non-Christians, Republicans or Democrats, whatever the, the tribe, right? The people who have different opinions than we do. It's really tempting. Again, chief center in the room. I got the microphone and there's no bigger hypocrite here than me. The way that we talk about people is not reflective of fruit bearers sometimes. It's really tempting to boil down the ideas of the other team to make them seem dumber than they are or to talk about people who disagree with us politically or ideologically as if they are um, small or ignorant or less than. To put them in a box, label all of them this one thing, and then, because it feels really good to be right, and I get that, I do. It feels good to be smart and feel like, like well, I've come at this from a, more of a critical thinking standpoint, and I've got to say, you people are just really stupid, and, and we geniuses are over here doing that. Like, it, it's tempting but it's not fruit bearing. My appeal today would be that if we're seeking to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to be striving to know the will of the Father, to grow in the knowledge of God, would be that we would see people the way that God sees people. God sees people as created in his image, even the wrong ones even the ones who have opinions that we disagree with or thoughts or ideas that we abhor and think are just so out there, they're created in his image. And as Christians and as fruit-bearing, God-loving, Christ-following people, we are to see everybody as either co-heirs in Christ, ready to inherit the kingdom of God shoulder to shoulder, brothers and sisters in Jesus, or marching headlong toward the gates of hell and desperately in need of a gospel. What I'm asking you to consider today is that as fruit bearers, instead of trying to burn down the whole forest to get our point across, instead, we don't flip off the microphone that somebody gives us into their life to share the gospel because we'd rather be right about political thoughts and ideas or ideologies. But instead, as fruit bearers, seeing people as God sees people, we seek to live out the will of God, which is to share the gospel with people, to love them more than we love being right. Let them be wrong. Let them think incorrectly about science and data and masks and pandemics and who to vote for and taxation and economic opportunity. Let them be wrong. But get in the way of them marching toward hell. Let that be the message that you care so much about. Real quick, forgot to disclaim this part too, and it's important. I'm not saying don't be politically involved or politically minded or politically engaged. I'm not saying that. I think there are a lot of great, worthy kingdom causes in the world of politics. Absolutely. And, and we need to have a voice there. I, I totally affirm that. Please don't hear it that way. What I'm saying is, don't give up your ability to speak the gospel into somebody's life because you want to tell them how wrong they are on Facebook. See people as God sees people. We need to 
be aware of and mindful of our tongue. We need to, we need to guard it the way that we speak as Christians, as fruit bearers, and as believers. James chapter 3, verses 5 through 7 says, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze in such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire this entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. I'm saying that we need to make sure that we've put things in the right order, a priority in our life, that we do it in a way that identifies the priority and order of God's will. And chief among them is worshiping and praising his name, loving his son, striving to look and act and be more like Jesus, who was patient and kind and gentle and all of these things that I and all of us fall short of. And if we've put things in the right order, if we've put things in the right place, then we're striving to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. From the beginning, the onset of the pandemic, there have been a lot of really challenging decisions that have had to be made here at Koinos by the leadership and uh, at all levels. I mean, life group leaders, kids' own leaders, certainly the elders and um, I'd love to be able to serve side by side with all of you in that. And it's, it's been real hard stuff. I mean, it's not like there's a book they give you when you open a church. It's like, when a pandemic happens, set up an online stream. Like, no, nobody knows. Like, we, we're scrambling. But I keep coming back to Titus 3. In the first two verses of Titus chapter 3, it says, Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Ugh, like that one. Perfect courtesy toward all people? That for me is incredibly convicting. And as a church, we've got something here, guys. God has given us something special. And I don't just mean the, the good feeling that we get when we come together and like we share life with each other. I'm talking about the eternal hope in Jesus that I think we take for granted as believers because we've known it and we have it. That is so meaningful to people who don't have it and don't know it. And they, they don't know what they're missing. And we have an opportunity in this world right now in the hardest year in my lifetime to be this light up on a hill, proclaiming the name of Jesus and hope that comes along with that. To be truth tellers about this God. And I want you to take a beat and just think about how has that changed your life? Could you imagine walking through the economic uncertainty that people are walking through right now, like people who have lost their jobs or may lose their jobs in the next few months or their businesses. Could you imagine trying to walk through that without God? That's terrifying. I'm super freaked out and I have them. Could you imagine? We should be that beacon of light because we've got what they need. Let's bear fruit in that way. Let's pray for our church that we would be those people with that message. For the people that we maybe disagree with, or people that don't know about Jesus, certainly and as a priority, but for all people, because that is the will of God. Final thought on fruit bearing, and then we'll move forward. Um, 1 Corinthians 8.13, I love this. It says, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. The will of the Father is that we're, we're out there collecting his sheep. That we're winning more of them. God wants us to be an instrument for his glory. He wants us to be the mouths that take the gospel. He wants us to be the, the hands and feet. What we are to be, we are to do his work to do and fulfill his will. Bear fruit. 
All right, let's talk about giving thanks. So, uh, Colossians 1, verse 10, So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. For those of you who are, are really going through it right now, um, in my experience, and, and maybe your job is secure and you're not, overly concerned about the pandemic, but maybe life was just hard before, right? Maybe you just deal with a crippling anxiety or a darkness, a depression that um, roots itself in your life at every turn. I just, I want to suggest to you that you would consider in those darkest times and those most um, crippling and challenging moments, go to the Father with a prayer of thanksgiving. What's our grandma always tell us to do? Count your blessings, right? We all always have something to be thankful for. If you were able to put your feet on the ground today and experience the creation of the Father, though you may have economic hardship and uncertainty, maybe somebody has sinned against you in an egregious way that has changed your life forever, you're in a pit of despair, maybe your brain's just turning on you and you're producing chemicals that are shutting it all down and it just feels dark. Know that God created you, he loves you, he wants to know you, and he has rescued you from the domain of darkness through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. So long as you are willing to ask for forgiveness of sins and say that that blood of his son was enough to cover me. And if you're new to the gospel, when Jesus came, he did walk in a manner worthy of God, fully pleasing to him. He didn't stumble and sin and fall short like we do. He did it. And yet, his body was broken and beaten and hung on a cross to die. He walked worthy, he bared fruit, and then he was still punished. And that was our punishment. He took it for us on our behalf. And then he conquered death and rose to heaven so that we would be qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light, delivering us from the domain of darkness, transferring us from the, to the kingdom of his beloved son. That is always true, no matter how hard it is today or how broken the world seems or feels, that is always true. And we always have somewhere to start when we go before the Father in prayer to give thanks. Thank you for that. So again, I think the prayer focus in this text today, and what I'm hopeful can be a prayer focus for our church, is that we would seek to be filled with the knowledge of his will, and that we would then live it out and walk that way. That's a real tall order, and I understand that. But I have some ideas I'm a big believer in never tell somebody what their problem is if you don't have a solution. And you're still probably being rude, even if you do it that way. But in Ohio, adults in our fine state of Ohio, we spend, of all the, all the states in the union, we, we rank number four in America for most time spent on our cell phones. Adults in Ohio. Woo! Um, thank God Arizona beat us, and they're, I think, number one. They're two more ahead of us. In Ohio, adults spend 231 minutes a day on our phones. That's nearly four hours a day. 27 hours a week. That's a job, guys. 27 hours a week, 58 days in a year gone to our phones. My, my challenge to you this week is that we reorient our lives to 
pursue after the will of the Father to grow in the knowledge of God so that we can bear fruit. So, here's a thought. Here's some homework. Go to the settings of your phone. For those of you who are already rumbling, I apologize. Go to the settings of your phone. Turn on the Screen Time app. Did you guys hear that? All those stomachs just hit the floor. Go turn on the Screen Time app, and what it's going to do is it's going to track how much time you're spending every day on that phone and what you're doing on it. And I know what you're thinking, but Brian... Three and a half hours a day, I'm on the Bible app, and I'm reading the Gospel Coalition and DesiringGod.org. I promise. No, I, I'm sure you are. I'm sure you are. But let's find out together. You know what I mean? Turn on that screen time app. Every day you're going to get a report that says, this is how much time you spent on it today, and this is what you were doing. And you're probably going to be amazed. If you haven't done this before, it's like super convicting and like embarrassing. Like You're just like, really? Wow. All those angry birds... And in and I'm old. Is that an old reference now? Gosh, all that Fortnite or whatever. I don't have the internet where I live. We're, we're basically Amish. Uh, we do have cell phones, so we do use them way too much. Um, use the screen time app. And then here's a practical thought: Let us strive to walk worthy. Let us spend, strive to redeem some of our time that is wasted putting things into our hearts and our minds that maybe do not align with the will of God. Let us try to redeem more of our time doing things that do and that help us grow in the knowledge of God. So as a goal for the week, whatever your phone tells you you did on Monday, let's try to do better on Tuesday, less time. Less time on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and throughout the week, shaving off the amount of time that we're spending looking at that and spend more time in redeeming God-honoring God-glorifying, God's will-seeking activities like being in prayer and being in the Word. And yeah, if you're using the Bible app, you can, re- you can subtract that time because it'll look, tell you how much time you're in that app. But let's redeem some of this time to set our sights as a church and as Christians and as families on the, on the will of God. Be in prayer, be in the Word. There are plenty of good resources to fill that, like that drive time or that, that like wasted, just chilling on my phone time. If you're podcast people, there are a lot of great podcasts. A lot of great churches have great sermon series on there. There's um, uh, John Piper sermons are on there. He's got his Ask Pastor John podcast series that go through a lot of great, weird theological questions maybe you've had or haven't had and haven't thought of, but there's a really neat way to kind of walk through the Bible and see what it says about all sorts of things in life. Um, There's a podcast called the Bible Project that walks through all sorts of text in the Old Testament and the New Testament and kind of breaks it down, gives you some historical context. And all of that is edifying, will build us up, and will help us increase in the knowledge of God. More than all of that, though, read your Bible. We all always have something to give thanks for. Let us do that with our time as well. I want to reiterate before we close today, I so love this place and I so love you people. And I never knew what knowing Jesus would do, like how it would change people's lives. It's changed mine. I look completely different than I did before I knew Jesus. And yet I'm still a sinner and fall short all the time. We covered it, I know. And it's been a real eye-opening and humbling thing to kind of see how all of us have risen up and, and cared for each other and and sacrificed and done things that we didn't want to do, you know, sitting further apart and wearing masks and doing all this stuff. And I love that you did it. I love this church and I love you people. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful, so grateful that you have qualified us, that you have qualified us to experience your eternal glory that you have called us out of the domain of darkness. Father, I ask that this church would look different than the world, that we would seek to be people who pursue after your will more than our own will, that we would be fruit bearers, Lord. Lord, help the members of this church and the church at large, Lord, let let us all strive to know you more and to love you more, to seek and love your will and your word. 
We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.